Time for questions to OFM DFM. And can I just inform uh, members that there are no questions withdrawn from this session? You'd be all glad to hear. It comes to Robin Swan. Mr. Speaker, question number one. Uh, since May 2011, our department has received 664 Freedom of Information requests. We answered 320 of them within 20 working days. Many of the requests uh, we receive are sensitive or complex in nature, and it is important that we take time to get them right. However, we recognize that our performance could be better, and we are working very hard to try and improve it. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. It could be better, I think, as an understatement, around 50%. Deputy First Minister, also in regard to answering written questions from the Assembly, the OFM DFM has about 15 per cent success rate of answering Assembly questions in time. Can the Minister tell me what is he going to do to increase the transparency and accountability of that office? Well, I think quite, quite clearly there is an acknowledgement that uh, in relation to the freedom of information request that uh, uh, more work needs to be done, and uh, we appreciate the uh, difficulties which flow from that. But I think the member has to understand that given the sensitive nature of uh, a considerable proportion of the FOI requests processed by OFM DFM, it is imperative that due consideration is given to responses to such requests. Uh, this may involve consultation with other departments and have an interest in the, uh, that have an interest in the subject matter of the information. Consultation with Third parties necessarily extends the period of time taken to compose appropriate responses. In addition, many more of the FOI requests that come to OFM, DFM are from uh, the media and interest groups rather than the general public. And uh, OFM, DFM isn't like any other department, as a member will know, that there are two parties in that department, and that complicates matters, uh, I think, considerably. Thank you, and I call Mr. Adrian McQuillan. You do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. The Executive's Disability Strategy was launched by the then Junior Minister Bell and I in February 2013. The strategy provides a high level policy framework for all departments to drive improved service delivery, increase awareness of the needs of people with disabilities, and improve opportunities for people with disabilities across all policy areas. The strategy includes priorities and actions to address identified inequalities experienced by people with disabilities and to tackle the barriers that they continue to face in their daily lives. A 2013-14 annual report on the delivery of the disability strategy has been published on the department's website, which sets out the actions that all executive departments have undertaken under the strategy in its first year. We will shortly be approaching departments for information on the actions they have taken during the second year of the implementation of the strategy. In May, Junior Minister McElveen and I announced the extension of the life of the strategy until 2017 to provide additional time to fully implement the recommendations. The extension is our commitment to continuing to protect and promote the rights of people with disabilities in our community and will also have the additional benefit of providing adequate time to develop and consult on the new strategy. Mr. McQuillan for supplementary. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Junior Minister for the answer there? Would the Junior Minister give us a guarantee to the House today by extending the strategy that it will not be diluted in any shape, form or fashion? No, I certainly can give you that guarantee that it won't be um, uh, diluted in any fashion. I did say that, that we have already um, we have taken forward a number of, of programmes and projects um, since it, the, it was first um, announced in 2013. We hosted a major conference in May of that year. We also worked in partnership with the Disability Action to develop a DVD resource pack, and that was for teachers and for youth workers you know, to provide information to pupils. We've contributed funding totaling um, £459,000 for the Special Olympics Ulster, and we sponsored a symposium event also. So we continue to, to carry that through. I will say that, that it's an executive strategy, and all departments have a commitment to, to um, input into the implementation and delivery of that strategy as well. Thank you. And Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can uh, I ask the um, 
when the Deputy First Minister or indeed the Junior Minister will be able to provide clarity for welfare reform mitigations which uh, were promised but not outlined in the recent so-called fresh start, perhaps so, uh, false dawn uh, report, which un undoubtedly will affect people with disabilities. Well, the member makes a very valid point, and it certainly um, those, those welfare cuts will impact on people with disabilities. We have, as a, as a member will know, have secured um, a fund of £585 million, £345 million of which is, is earmarked for, for um, people uh, who's going to lose through disability benefits, or uh, sorry, through welfare cuts. Um, and really, you know, Eileen Everson, as you know, um, who is really a real sterling campaigner for, for people on disability um, uh, and disability rights and also on all sorts of um, other areas in terms of that. She will be bringing forward um, her proposals with, when she consults with her panel of experts in uh, January uh, ne next month. So really, you know, we are hopeful that Eileen Everson will be able to use that envelope of money that we secured in the Fresh Start to actually you know, uh, alleviate some of the, the, the wider impacts that people, particularly people who will lose out um, in welfare cuts, but as the, the member mentioned, people um, with disabilities. I call Ms Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the junior minister or the deputy first minister recognise the failure of departments to work together for the needs of people with disabilities, which has led to lost provision, and how do they plan to address it? Again, I think a member, you know, we, we have, as I said, you know, this is an executive strategy in OFM, DFM, have specific um, areas of work and uh, bringing that forward. And one of that is monitoring and evaluating um, just in terms of what other executive departments are doing. We have published a baseline indicator set which um, is using that data, um, are using data from 2006 um, to actually work, you know, and, and measure those, those uh, outputs, if you like, that are coming forward. But you know, we, we work we work with the stakeholder groups, and I know we last week myself and Junior Minister Pengelly was at an event up in the Long Gallery, where people you know from the people who had disabilities mm. themselves were actually saying to us, you know, that, that they want to be also part of um, any sort of delivery mechanisms going forward. And we certainly, at at OFM DFM level, we are putting that um, put that in place, where people, not just people who are representing the sector, um, uh, who are, are but also people who are actually you know, um, facing those disabilities, facing those bar barriers and those challenges every day of their lives, that basically we are going to be um, making sure that they are involved in any sort of implementation of the strategy, but certainly in any forward thinking that we are going to be doing. And that will be across all departments, because as I said, we have the responsibility for the monitoring and evaluation of that strategy as well. Gregory Campbell. Number three, Mr Speaker. Uh, during the talks process, uh, good progress was made in many aspects relating to the past, uh, but we were unable to agree a way forward on a number of the key issues within the timescales to which we were working. This was unfortunate, but it is recognised that uh, this is not an issue on which there can be a half-hearted or partial agreement for the sake of expediency. Uh, the Fresh Start Agreement uh, commits the British and Irish governments to reflect on options for resolving the legacy issues, building therefore on the sound basis that already exists. Through our earlier discussions, we will engage fully with the two governments on the options uh, which they may bring forward uh, for uh, to deal with this particular issue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Deputy First Minister referred to good progress being made, and that is true. But does he not agree that better progress would be made, for example, if he tried to shore up whatever credibility he has in terms of his past. For example, on a number of occasions now in the chamber, I have alluded to his possession of a submachine gun as uh, contained in the Savile report, uh, his involvement, if he had any, in the two policemen who were shot dead three days before Bloody Sunday, the Claudie bomb and the murder of a prison officer a few years after Bloody Sunday. They all happened when the Deputy First Minister was the 2IC of the Provisional IRA in Londonderry, and yet he denied knowledge or involvement in any of them. So where does his credibility stand? Well, I, I never imagined for one minute that the uh, fresh start uh, would extend to the member who has uh, just spoken. Uh, not for 
not for one minute. And uh, the member uh, is uh, often in, in this chamber prepared to quote all sorts of falsehoods and innuendo about my past. Uh, the reality is, in relation to the Savile uh, report, which I'm glad he mentioned, is that the most significant ruling made by Lord Savile was that he believed the IRA's evidence. I went forward as a member of the IRA. My evidence was believed by Lord Savile, and the evidence of the paratroopers and the British Army that was rejected. So I think it's, it's not a great issue for the member to raise in this House, particularly as someone who comes from uh, the city of Derry. So I think that from, from my perspective, I look at all of this on the basis that uh, over the course of the next while, the member will have a big decision to make in relation to his future, whether or not he will remain in this House or go to another place. I hope he continues to remain in this House and continues to enjoy sharing power with Sinn Féin. <laughs> and the call, Mr. Allegadwood. Thank you. In attempt to answer more, ask a more balanced question than the uh, previous MLA, can I ask the uh, Deputy First Minister, does he agree that the blanket of national security that the British government wrapped itself in the talks recently was a further example of their resistance to the truth and truth-telling on their terms only. But would he also agree that the evidence of many years is that Republican and Loyalist organisations do exactly the same, resist the truth, and will only tell the truth on their terms? How can you reconcile the needs of victims and survivors if that is the attitude of so many? Well, first of all, I think that it's uh, critically important in the weeks ahead that we uh, see a situation where uh, a very determined effort is made by the government and the parties to find a way forward. Uh, the particular blockage during the course of the Stormont House negotiations was the refusal of the British government to accede to the requests of many victims groups in relation to disclosure and this blanket of national security, as the member talked about. You see, the big test, uh, I would suggest to the member for West Belfast, is to establish the structures and mechanisms that uh, we agreed and, and reached a considerable amount of agreement on in the course of the talks. That will be the test as to whether or not people are prepared to come forward and contribute. I have just cited in my previous answer my willingness on behalf of being asked by the uh, bloody Sunday families to come forward as a member of the IRA to talk about the situation in relation to Bloody Sunday. I think that's a very clear indicator of where I'm coming from in relation to all of it. I've done it. I've been there. I've worn the T-shirt. The comments of Jim Allister. In terms of wearing the T-shirt, the T-shirt he wore at Savo was to take refuge in the Republican Code of Honour. Does that still trump for the Deputy First Minister who demands wholesale disclosure from government? Does, it, does the Republican Code of Honour still trump for him the telling of the truth? And how does that play with lesser participants in the IRA terrorist campaign if someone of the Deputy First Minister's leadership and status in that campaign takes refuge in not telling the truth under the Code of Honour, so-called? Of course, uh, th this member is uh, one that has never made any positive contribution to any of the difficulties that we have uh, been trying to deal with in terms of uh, overall policy in the Assembly and the working of the Executive. This is someone who is totally hostile to the institutions that have been so much an integral part of the peace process. Uh, and I think that from the perspective of uh, the contribution that has just been made, you see, the big challenge is this. The big challenge is to find a way forward to deal with the legacy issues. Whenever we find that, and I believe that we will find that in the time ahead, there will then be a test for everybody, for the British government, for uh, the IRA and other armed groups on the Republican side, for uh, loyalist organisations, for those people in British intelligence who controlled loyalist death squads, and indeed controlled some Republicans in their agenda to try and defeat the uh, legitimate demands of the nationalist and republican community for equality, for justice uh, and for peace. So I think that uh, what the member needs to do is 
try to focus on making a more positive contribution to this place. Uh, I'm glad he's here. I'm glad he is making a contribution. And like the member for East Derry, or as the electoral authorities call it, East London Derry, continue to enjoy sharing power with Sinn Féin. Thank you. And I call Mr George Robinson. Question four, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Department received seven proposals to purchase and develop the Shackleton site as part of the open competitive sale process. Uh, these proposals are currently being assessed and it is expected that the preferred uh, purchaser will be notified shortly. Uh, we hope to be in a position to make an announcement about the successful purchaser early in the new year once the legal work has been completed. I call Mr Robinson for uh, Thanks Mr Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Deputy Minister, considering the potential job creation in Ballykelly, would the Minister outline what discussions he has had with other executive colleagues regarding the provision of good vehicle access and public transport provision, including a small rail halt to the Shackleton site? Well, I, I know the member, as other members in the constituency, have uh, a, a tremendous interest in uh, this, this site. It is a, a site which uh, at the beginning, uh, was seen by, by many people as being one that would be very difficult to sell. But I think the, the fact that uh, we were able to negotiate within the executive the relocation of the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development to the site obviously brought a huge focus on the site, and that's why we've, we've received seven bidders. So obviously that decision will be made uh, in due course. In relation to the DARD relocating there, there is, as the member has suggested, an issue of access, and that is something which is uh, presently being, uh, being worked upon. I think that the advice from Transport NI is that accommodating DARD on the site will require a new access road, which will mean additional land being acquired adjacent to the site on the A2, that's the main dairy Limavati Road. This has required negotiations with the current landowners, and DARD officials have engaged with land and property service who are responsible for the negotiations on behalf of uh, the government. The, the new access arrangements will be designed sensitively, taking into account the listed structures that are close to the site, such as the church and the graveyard, in order to maintain the character of the area. The Central Procurement Directorate are currently working with the NIA Environment Agency and DOE to agree the optimum position for the access road. Advice to date has been that uh, there are no major issues that would prohibit development as long as the new building and infrastructure are sensitive to the surrounding area. So it's a very exciting uh, piece of real estate and uh, we are very hopeful that whoever uh, acquires the, the, new, the new site will use it to achieve what I think is the primary aim of most members in this House of securing much needed employment for the North West. Thank you. And I'll call Mr Cahill O'Hashin. Uh, 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 um, the Minister agreed with me that given the level of interest and the diversity of that interest, that there may be an opportunity there to accommodate more than a single uh, bidder on the site. Thank you. Well, I, th I think we, we all know that that would principally be uh, a matter for the new owner of the site, uh, and that's something that they would have to consider in due course. Of course, we, we would encourage the new owner to explore all opportunities to maximise the developmental uh, potential of the site. Some of the proposed uses identified in other proposals could well be compatible with the new owner's intended use. Uh, when the uh, assessment process has concluded, uh, myself and the, the, the First Minister will encourage and facilitate the new owner to explore opportunities for strategic partnerships with all our proposers, and we regard the development plan of the new owner very much as the beginning of the development on the site and hope that it will be the springboard for wider development uh, activity uh, to generate much needed economic benefits for the North West. John Dallet. I'm sure uh, people in East Derry will be listening with great interest, an area of very high unemployment. Uh, where those who haven't emigrated are living in hope that something significant will emerge out of this former army uh, camp. Can the Minister, in the mouth of Christmas when we're supposed to be full of cheer, give us some indication of the number of jobs, potentially, that will emerge out of this 
wonderful asset that was bequeathed to us. Well, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's very difficult at this stage and would even be presumptuous on my part, but I think it is important to stress that uh, the, the, the preferred proposal for the Shackleton site will be that which attains the highest score. Scores will be allocated based on the number of jobs to be created, the financial offer for the site, and the extent to which proposals will deliver community and environmental benefits. So we have attached additional weighting to the creation of jobs, uh, and that's our priority for the site. But I think you know, it's a very exciting prospect, and I think the member knows that. At the very beginning of this process, not too many people held out much hope that there could be anything of any real value on that site. It has now become a very exciting opportunity for people in the Northwest. I think the relocation of DAR with hundreds of uh, employees moving to the site in 2017 uh, will, be, will be a major attractor, as well as the project that NAW are involved in, which is an environmental project, which will serve the interests of the local community in that area. So there's a huge priority placed on the preferred bidder uh, being able to assure us that uh, jobs will be the key target in all of it. And that brings into play the uh, question asked by the previous member in relation to whether or not uh, whoever acquires the site uh, is prepared to work with others to develop it to its full potential. Uh, we will certainly, the First Minister and myself, we, we've taken a very keen interest in this site, be very keen to see the uh, uh, creation of as many jobs as possible on the site, and uh, I'm very confident about the future for that site. Again, I call Ms. Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, how has the department been encouraging bidders to uh, consider the community and voluntary sector as part of their proposed plans? Well, I, I think both the first minister and myself have, have been uh, to the area. We, we've met with people in the uh, local community, and that uh, we understand the interest that they have. And we absolutely wish to ensure the community, that the community in Ballykelly and the surrounding area benefit from the development of the Shackleton site. For, for this reason, proposals to purchase the site are being uh, assessed on the extent to which their plans to develop the site will, develop, will deliver uh, community benefits. So it is an important uh, subject. Uh, I think it's critically important whenever you have such a major development on a site so, so close to uh, a village area that the local community can feel ownership of the site and have a stake on it, and we're very determined to ensure that however the site is developed, it's developed certainly in the interest of the local community. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question five. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister McCann to answer this question. Consultation on the executive draft child care strategy took place between the 20th of July and the 13th of November this year. Departmental officials engaged widely with stakeholders during the consultation period to promote awareness and understanding of the draft strategy and to encourage feedback on draft proposals. The child care strategy will build on the success of the 15 key first actions launched in 2013 in order to address priority child care needs identified through early research and consultation. The school age child care grant scheme was developed to address priority need. The grant scheme is creating new, low cost, quality school, school age child care places and sustaining the places we already have. To date, the grant scheme has held two calls for applications and has committed £3 million to projects which will sustain or create approximately 2,200 low cost, quality child care places, mostly in disadvantaged areas. A third call for applications was launched on the 26th of November. Other key first actions have enhanced child care services for children with a disability and improved the information available to parents on the child care services available locally. Officials are currently collating and analysing responses to the public consultation and we will give careful consideration to the range of views put forward to us. We will continue to work in partnership with other executive departments through the Child Care Strategy Programme Board and we will aim to finalise the strategy in early 2016. Thank you, Uncle Ms. Bradley, for a supplement. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the junior minister uh, for her answer? Um, as the junior minister would know, with the introduction of welfare reform and the wreckage that was the ESF funding, um, how that uncertainty has affected the women's sector and, and, and the women's lobby. And can I just ask the minister, would she agree with me that we need to be doing everything within our power to empower parents, and especially women, um, to get back into the workplace and, uh, and to continue with education, because that will have a great knock-on effect on our economy also. Yes, and I think uh, that the member is right. And the child care strategy, as you know, has two high-level aims, to promote child development, but also to enable parents to get back into the workforce. And that has to be, in, in a sense, parental choice also. And I think that you made a very valid point in terms of the DSD. Uh, Women's Centre Child Care Fund, and I know I've had a number of meetings, and our officials are working very closely with the Minister in DSD. You know, and, and we want to ensure, you know, that those child care settings that have been adversely or would be adversely affected by the closure of that fund will actually be open to the, the new child care um, strategy funding because it's essential, particularly, you know, and I know myself even um, talking to some of the, the providers of women's centres child care, for instance, that a lot of the mothers, you know, returning to education, returning to training, or even going to employment, actually, you know, um, like to, to be on sites. You know where their children are, are being looked after as well. That's very, very important too. So certainly, and um, we'll continue with our deliberations with the DSD minister and the officials to ensure that there's a hopefully you know a seamless move from that funding to to uh, the child care funding when, whenever that uh, has to happen. The uh, junior minister for her answers thus far. But can, you, can the Minister clarify what is meant by sustainability in respect to the child care strategy? Well, sustainability is one of the principles underpinning our child care strategy. And as I said, you know, I've heard from many in the course of the consultation who are really concerned about this. That's not just child care providers, but that's also um, parents as well. Sustainability doesn't have to mean non-subsidised child care. For some child care organisations, subsidies may not be required. However, particularly in, in some areas where there are high levels of deprivation right across the north, and particularly so um, even areas within my own constituency of, of West Belfast, no subsidies would mean the eradication of child care provision. It is unrealistic, at least in the foreseeable future, to see how some of these areas with extremely high levels of multiple deprivation could support child care provision without some sort of subvention. So when I refer to sustainability, it is within the context of recognising that government needs to work in partnership with child care providers to address our shared objectives of addressing child poverty, children's social and emotional development developmental needs and providing much needed employment for child care workers in areas with where high unemployment. So you know sustainability, as I said, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that those providers have to go on without any subvention at all. Certainly uh, there are some provisions that will always need that type of subvention. Thanks very much Mr Speaker and I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, could the minister uh, clarify to me, please, the, the child poverty, or sorry, the child strategy, child care strategy? <clears throat> what, what aspects of, particularly, family poverty, is it taken into consideration? Where you have situations where we've obviously heard about child poverty issues being addressed, development of the child being addressed, which are all very, very worthwhile and an integral part of the strategy. What aspects of the strategy are dealing with those situations where families, in particular, young mums, are being forced? because of the exorbitant cost of childcare, to leave their workplace? In other words, what support is there for those working families who are on the bread line? I mean, just a, as I said to the member in my last answer there, you know, I mean, we, we really have those two high-level aims, and one is to enable parents to join the workforce, and whether that's to, to, you know, um, in terms of um, we want to be able to, in terms of the, 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 this strategy, we want to, to enable it to be affordable for people as well, because that's a very, very key part of it. When, even during the consultation and some of the responses that we have seen already, affordability is a key issue. And I think that, that really, you know, we need to be able to ensure um, any subsidies that we're given in the terms of particularly um, child care provision in, in areas um, uh, of disadvantage and need, but also where families on low income that certainly that, that those subsidies will, will be able to ensure 
like they do in, in the, like the, the Women's Centre Child Care Fund, that they will actually be able to ensure that costs will be kept at a very, very low price for parents who maybe um, have a lower incomes and really need you know, the, the availability of that. So we'll be looking at all the schemes right across the piece in terms of going forward to ensure that those parents can avail of, of that quality child care as well. Thank you, and that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to uh, topical questions. And I call Mr. David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can the, the, the first minister, or sorry, deputy first minister, give his, his current assessment of the, the work of the civil contingencies policy branch across the public sector? Well, I, I presume that uh, this uh, question is asked in the context of the. Uh, Storm Desmond and the Storm Desmond and the implications uh, for our society as a result of severe flooding uh, all over the north. If, if I'm wrong, he can correct me in his uh, supplementary. But obviously, we, we've seen uh, the uh, fl flooding, which has been fairly widespread, indeed all over the island of Ireland, but particularly in certain parts of the north. And the Rivers Agency have been. Uh, I think working uh, very uh, diligently on the ground, cooperating with all our departments to ensure that uh, we bring respite to the local community. The Department of the Environment has already allocated uh, uh, support of £1,000 per household. And I think quite clearly in terms of the contingency approach that we need to adopt across has to, has to be to deal with uh, natural consequences such as the consequences from Storm Desmond. But civil contingencies goes wider than that and could conceivably uh, require to be called on in the event of any eventuality. Thank you. And I call Mr Hildes for a supplement. Th thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. And it was more a general sort of on the policy, on the work of the policy there, uh, and could the first minister, in, in light of recent incidents around the world globally, can the, the deputy first minister assure us that Northern Ireland is at a level of readiness and preparedness in the event of a civil emergency? Well, I, I, I certainly think that uh, all of the emergency services, uh, given the experiences that we've seen in other parts of the world, are very conscious of their responsibilities should something untoward happen. Uh, it is predicted that the likelihood of something untoward happening here is very remote. Uh, my own sense of it is that it is very remote. It is quite obvious if you are speaking about the activities of this group, uh, ISIS, ISIL, Daesh or whatever you want to call them, that uh, their focus appears to be on uh, major centres like Paris, London other parts of uh, Europe. But I certainly think from our perspective, it is very important that in any eventuality that we pre be prepared. And as we saw in California over the course of the last week, uh, something could happen anywhere at any moment. And I don't have any doubt whatsoever that the emergency services in terms of the, uh, the, the, the police service, uh, in terms of the fire and rescue service, and other services under the control of our departments uh, have uh, plans in place to deal with any eventuality. Well, Ms. Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister: Does he agree that the skill set available in Northern Ireland was a contributing factor to the, jo to the job announcement by the American company One Source Virtual? Well, I, I was very pleased to be at the uh, official opening, along with our uh, regional development uh, minister, Michelle McElveen, on Friday. And there is absolutely no doubt whatsoever that the educational capabilities of our young people emerging from uh, the different uh, educational institutions uh, did have a big impact. Uh, it's uh, no mean achievement to, to acquire a company, uh, which is obviously a young company, but a growing company, uh, providing anything up to 290 jobs over the course of the next while. Uh, over 40 people are presently employed. Uh, hiring has now started for another 45, and they're building to 290. And that has been b based on, I think, the culture that's in the city, where they have set up my own city. 
the uh, quality of the, uh, our education system and the, uh, the, the willingness of companies like that to recognise, particularly in the, the context of uh, the European dimension. For example, what they're opening in, in the city of Derry is, is effectively their European headquarters. That's a big decision for such a company, but I think it sends a very powerful message to other companies who are looking at the prospect of uh, locating uh, in the north that, that we do have uh, the quality and uh, quantity of people that they require to fulfil their needs. Obviously, that does represent a challenge for the executive and the uh, Department of Employment and Learning. And I think that we, what we have to do in any future budgetary discussions is take account of that as a prerequisite for what these companies need. For supplement. Thank you. And I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. And will he agree with me then that the reduction of corporation tax gives Northern Ireland an, an unprecedented opportunity for thousands of new jobs in the future, sending out a loud and clear message to the rest of the world that Northern Ireland is the place for business? Uh, anybody that read my article in the Belfast Telegraph and in the Irish News in the course of the, the last week will we'll see that uh, we have stood by with the other parties on the executive, our belief that the reduction, uh, and obviously it will all centre around uh, our budgetary challenges and affordability and all the rest of them, but we are working on the basis that we will be able to do this, because to put people in, in the region of something of 30,000 to 35,000 people into jobs is uh, a huge thing for our executive and for the development of our economy. And the First Minister and I, who have been involved in all sorts of economic missions to the United States, uh, have for a very long time recognised that, that there are many companies in the United States who are only too keen to locate here in the North. And I, and I think having an, an island-wide 12.5% uh, rate of corporation tax is actually highly advantageous for us because of what we think are the attributes that we have in, in attracting people uh, to, uh, to the north, to, to areas, particularly areas of uh, high unemployment, where those figures of 30 to 35,000 would clearly make a massive impact on what are unacceptable unemployment figures at the moment. So I think what we have to do is keep our nerve in all of this stuff. I know that there are people out there who are ready to criticise this, but we've made an assessment that we want to put our people into meaningful jobs, and we're very determined to do that. Obviously, in terms of how we work our budgets over the course of the next uh, number of years, will be critical to how we can do that. And call Ms. Pa Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Deputy First Minister just to follow on from what uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Hildage? Um, had asked earlier, you had given an answer to do with the adverse weather conditions, and we did have an extremely bad weekend where we saw businesses ruined, uh, we, we saw uh, closure of roads, and we also saw risk to human life. And thankfully, we have got uh, uh, some very, very good people within our statutory agencies. But can I just ask him, is there an overall arching task force um, that looks at the potential of, of risk around our weather conditions, because it's something that I feel is going to continue? Well, the answer to that is yes. Under the stewardship of the head of the civil service, uh, these people meet uh, regularly on a consistent basis, uh, not, not just at a time of crisis, but uh, in order to ensure that we are well prepared for any eventuality. Bradley, for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer? He's partially answered what I was going to ask next, and I, I welcome that. And it's good to see that we have that in place because we have still got the worst part of the winter uh, to come, and we know that there, there will be problems that arise. Uh, this agent, or this task force that we have in place, how often do they meet? Are they meeting on a regular basis to discuss the updates on this? Well, uh, off the top of my head, I can't say how regularly they meet, but we will get you an answer to that. Uh, I think that. This is an opportunity to pay tribute to everybody in the emergency services who, at, at a time of uh, crisis, uh, are only too ready to, to put themselves out in all sorts of wellers to ensure the safety of the public and also to try and remediate the challenges that we face. Uh, and the member is quite right. We've been through a, 
uh, a very bad experience over the course of uh, the last uh, short while. Uh, and I can only imagine when, whenever we look at how this affects us here, where we do have roads blocked. Thankfully, the most important thing is that nobody has lost their lives. Uh, when you look at uh, you know, uh, mudslides in the Philippines or in India, people are losing their lives by the thousands. And I think the fact that our emergency services, whenever something happens, are, are on the ball is a credit to all of them. At the same time, uh, we, we have to legislate for the fact that unprecedented levels of rainfall fell, fell over the course of the last short while with uh, Storm Desmond. And uh, some parts of the country have been worse affected than ours. But, but we'll come out of it. We've always had the experience that the cleanups happen very, very rapidly that the insurance companies kick in to support those who have insurance, and in the cases particularly of households that don't have insurance, then the £1,000 per household kicks in from the Department of the Environment. When it comes to Sean Rudd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Having surrendered welfare, reform, welfare to Westminster and bearing in mind the extra financial commitments of, of uh, the British Government going to war last week, does the Deputy First Minister concede they were totally at the mercy of the Department of Work and Pensions in terms of the imposition of a benefit freeze and a reduction in the benefit cap. Well, I, what I thought was the, the most significant feature of the vote that took place in this House to, to deal with what I regarded as a technicality, which has a sunset clause, uh, which ensures that uh, the the uh, the power resides with this executive. But I thought the most interesting aspect of that, given this latest question from uh, the member for South Down, was that only eight members of the SDLP bothered to turn up to vote. And during the course of the debate, during the course of the debate, the new party leader wasn't present during any of the debate, and the new party leader himself didn't even vote. That's how seriously the SDLP took the decision that was taken in this assembly. What we have done is that we have, as a result of our negotiations, put in place a fund of £585 million to ensure that we will support those people who are worst affected by the uh, British uh, government cuts. And uh, we do that under the tutelage of uh, Eileen Everson, who is very experienced uh, in dealing with all of these matters. Uh, that's a practical contribution towards alleviating the plight of those people. And it is something that nowhere else, it's not happening in England, it's not happening in Wales, and it's not happening in Scotland, but it's happening here. Mr. Rogers, for some... Could I thank the Deputy First Minister, and I'm not surprised at the attack on the SDLP, but could I say to him then as an Irish Republican, was it, was it a mistake to surrender this to, to Westminster, and two, does he see it as an attack on devolution? Well, as I said in my earlier answer, I regard it as a technicality, which, which, which saved us £40 million. Pounds. I think the member needs to get real, and I do think the SDLP need to get real. The, the fact that we went that technical route, uh, which has the sunset clause, which ensures that powers reside in this executive, actually saved our institutions £40 million, pounds, which we can put to good use on behalf of the people who send us to this House. Mr. Uh, question number six. Sorry. Oh, topical question, sorry. Um, the Northern Ireland uh, Executive and uh, the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister in particular have produced reams of consultations and strategies but been less able in terms of their legislative programme. Um, would the Minister acknowledge that there is a weakness there? Junior Minister McKeon will take this question. Let, let me apologise to yourselves and to your Karen McKevitt withdrew her question in good time and appropriately, but I forgot to alert the House. Oh, the legislative programme? Okay, well, um, the member will be aware, you know, it's set out in, in legislation that we do have to consult. So, I mean, any sort of uh, programmes we're bringing forward in terms of legislation, there is a statutory responsibility on the department, of all departments, 
you know, for, for to set out um, uh, their consultation within a period of time. So, and that also, and no matter what, what sort of um, area you're working in, that you would still have to consult with people and put that out for public consultation. So, that that would be happening. <laughs> You'll be glad to hear the time is up. I